Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our series on endodontics. Like all my videos, I'm going to be focusing only on the highest yield topics. And this is actually the last video in our series before our bonus video with those practice questions that'll be modeled after actual board exam questions and cover all of the videos, all of the topics we've talked about within them. So in this last video, we're going to talk about adjunctive endodontic therapies that we didn't get a chance to cover in the previous videos. And we're going to focus primarily on vital pulp therapy and what that's all about. But first, I wanted to talk a little bit about two materials that are used routinely in endodontics and particularly in the realm of vital pulp therapy. So the first one is calcium hydroxide, which we've talked about in the previous videos, but I just wanted to reintroduce it and some of the major concepts that come along with it. So calcium hydroxide stimulates secondary odontoblasts to repair with dentinal bridge formation. And so back from our very first video in the series, we talked about these things called undifferentiated mesenchymal cells, and they can sort of become different cells depending on what they're being asked to do. They're kind of like stem cells. And calcium hydroxide can stimulate those cells to become secondary odontoblasts, which then are in turn stimulated to form tertiary dentin. And that tertiary dentin, or this dentinal bridge, is a barrier that can protect the pulp. So that's basically how calcium hydroxide works, and it does so by having a very high pH, a very basic pH of around 12.5, which both cauterizes the tissue, irritates these cells, and also kills bacteria. And the other material is mineral trioxide aggregate, or more commonly referred to as MTA. And this uh, material does something a little bit differently. It stimulates cementoblasts to produce hard tissue. So the other one, uh, so calcium hydroxide, is targeting odontoblasts, or secondary odontoplasts, to make dentin, whereas this one is targeting cementoblasts to, again, produce hard tissue. So is, as the name suggests, it's a, an aggregate of three minerals, and those are calcium, silicon, and aluminum. And so it contains, it's basically a cement with an aggregation or combination of these three minerals, and it consists of hydrophilic particles of calcium phosphate and calcium oxide and uh, different combinations of those things. So the only downsides to this uh, material is that it has a long setting time of about three hours, and it contains this thing called bismuth oxide. And the bismuth oxide is in a pacifier, which is helpful. It basically means it allows you to detect it on an x-ray. It'll show up as being radiopaque, but this material can leak and stain the tooth, so not great for anterior teeth. But otherwise, this is really a superior product to calcium hydroxide in almost every regard. And there are really three things that it does very, very well. First, it seals really well because it sets in the presence of moisture, so it doesn't dissolve in saliva. So isolation isn't really that big of an issue. Um, antimicrobial, yes, calcium hydroxide also does this, and it's non-resorbable. Uh, whereas calcium hydroxide is very resorbable, this is both non-resorbable and biocompatible. It's basically like a sand, you can think of it. So again, it's a great sealing agent. It does that really, really well. So for MTA, you, re you can remember the three threes. And um, I'll point those out. The three threes are, it's consisted of three minerals. It has a three hour setting time and there are three things that make it very, very useful. So those are your three threes to remember for mineral trioxide aggregate. All right, and so now we can talk about vital pulp therapies. So vital pulp therapy includes those treatment options for a pulp that is vital, and you want to maintain vitality, uh, but there's some sort of 
a disease or some sort of pulp exposure, something that's currently troubling the pulp, but it's still vital and we want to maintain its vitality. So in bold are all of the vital pulp therapies and the rest are, you can think of them like non-vital pulp therapies. Um, so this is a pretty comprehensive list of treatment options for endodontic problems. And of course, I always like to abbreviate where I can and where it helps. So I've included those as well on the right. Um, so if those pop up in other videos or later in this video, you kind of know what I'm referring to. All right, so our first one is an indirect pulp cap. And so this is where we would use um, calcium hydroxide or a resin modified glass ionomer restorative material. And it's placed on a thin partition of remaining dentin that if removed might expose the healthy pulp. And in all these treatment options, I will have underlined the status of the pulp when performing this uh, certain treatment. And so an indication for it would be deep caries that's approximating the pulp. So you go to uh, remove the caries, get to sound uh, tooth structure axially and um, on the sides of your prep, and you're getting pretty close to the pulp tissue. And so if we still had some caries that if we were to remove them might expose the pulp, we could elect to actually leave that carious dent in there and place this indirect pulp cap. It's not touching the pulp, but it's very, very close, certainly less than a millimeter away. And so this indirect pulp cap would be composed of one, or uh, maybe you could have calcium hydroxide lining the bottom of it, and then resin modified glass ionomer over the top of it, because remember calcium hydroxide is very resorbable and will dissolve in saliva so we can protect it with something that won't, like a resin modified glass ionomer. So that's an example of an indirect pulp cap. Then of course we have the direct pulp cap where you have the calcium hydroxide placed directly on an otherwise healthy pulp exposure. So now we've gotten to the point where the pulp is exposed and we want to make sure we can cover it. So as promised, this is a review from the last video where a direct pulp cap is a treatment of choice if a tooth is fractured and a pulp exposure occurred less than 24 hours ago. So we wanna to try to save that pulp tissue as much as possible by directly capping it or covering it with this calcium hydroxide material that we just talked about. So it can also be used for a carious or mechanical exposure that's less than two millimeters you know, across. And so this would be, we're in the indirect pulp cap scenario and we go a little bit too deep and we have a little pinpoint pulp exposure. And so direct pulp cap would be a nice option to try to save the pulp there. And a hard tissue barrier will hopefully form within six weeks. And so when we were talking about calcium hydroxide, again, that's stimulating those secondary odontoblasts to make that dentinal bridge to physically protect the pulp with a barrier. So that's what we're hoping to happen from this direct pulp cap. And so this is actually a less uh, favorable prognosis than the indirect pulp cap, because instead of maintaining a thin partition of dentin, we are relying on those secondary odontoblasts to respond and create a tertiary dentin bridge. So in other words, we're right up against the pulp here. So you can think the deeper you are, the worse your prognosis will likely be. All right, and next we have the Svec pulpotomy, which is a little bit difficult to find a good picture for this one, um, but this is otherwise known as a partial pulpotomy or a shallow pulpotomy. And it involves the removal of a small portion of coronal diseased pulp. So here in this picture, we have this little portion of infected pulp tissue, and say we were removing this deep carious lesion and th those bacteria and their byproducts have infiltrated the pulp tissue and that's really inflamed and really bothered. And we can tell that um, by say very profuse bleeding or 
uh, heme that is coming from this pulp exposure. And so we want to remove that. We don't want to leave that there. It's a little bit too far gone to just try to uh, indirect or direct pulp cap over that. This could also result from a traumatic exposure, uh, or this could also be the process you want to go through for a traumatic exposure that's been more than 24 hours. Uh, you know, a situation where the pulp has been exposed to the elements a little bit too long and is starting to become bothered and diseased. You want to remove a very little bit of that pulp that has been exposed. And again, if we have a carious or mechanical exposure that's larger than two millimeters across, well, this is a situation where it's just not feasible to do a direct pulp cap and the risk of failure outweighs the potential benefit. So we would elect to do a spec pulpotomy and then cover it from there. Now the next stage in terms of uh, a more involved procedure would be a full pulpotomy. And so this is the removal of coronal diseased pulp. So for pulpotomy, just remember it's only the coronal pulp tissue that's being removed, the pulp of the crown part of the tooth. So this would be something you would do, as I mentioned in the last video, for a traumatic exposure that's been more than 72 hours. So now we're, we're too far gone for the direct pulp cap, we're too far gone even for the spec pulpotomy, we have to do a full pulpotomy and remove the entire coronal pulp. Now for primary teeth, this would be something you'd want to do for a vital and restorable primary tooth with a pulp exposure. And it's ideal for that tooth to have no symptoms. So you'd prefer for that primary tooth to be asymptomatic. And for primary teeth, Really, the vast majority of pulpotomies are done for primary teeth in this way in order to save them as uh, their function, which is a space maintainer. And so this picture uh, illustrates a classic pulpotomy for a primary tooth. And you would place, uh, you would remove that coronal pulp tissue. Uh, you'd have this formocresol. You'd place formocresol right over the orifices to the pulp canals and you place it with a cotton pellet and there's this area of fixation that occurs where the pulp directly contacts the formocresol and that medicament which I will talk about in the next slide renders it resistant to enzymatic breakdown and under this area is an area of coagulation necrosis and so that's where the pulp tissue will unfortunately die, but hopefully there's still some vital tissue left in the apical part of the pulp canals. So that tooth can technically maintain some vitality. And then over that, we would put a, a zinc oxide eugenol core buildup and a stainless steel crown over the top of that. So that's a very classic primary tooth pulpotomy. And both spec and regular pulpotomies may not be indicated for mature permanent teeth, because they may induce undesirable calcification in the pulp canals. All right, so there's this uh, certain type of formocresol called Buckley's formocresol, which could be tested on the exam, and it's the one that we would use for those pulpotomies to fixate the, or quote unquote, fixate the pulp. So it contains 19% uh, formaldehyde and 35% tricresol, and that's how it gets its name, formo from formaldehyde and cresol from cresol, and then 15% glycerin, the rest is a water base. And for me, uh, formocresol is both a, a bactericidal agent, it kills bacteria, and it's also uh, quote-unquote fixative. Basically, it fixes the pulp tissue devitalizes it in that little fixation zone and makes it resistant to enzymatic breakdown. And it's been used for many years, but still remains controversial because it's very toxic. But if used in the correct dilution for no longer than is necessary, the risk of any mutagenesis, any cancer, or otherwise is inconsequential. All right, and the next one we're going to talk about is pulpectomy. And you can kind of think of it like the root canal, th uh, the root canal treatment without the gutta percha obturation step, and instead placing a creamy zinc oxide eugenol fill. 
And so the pulpectomy involves removal of coronal and radicular dead or dying pulp tissue. So the pulpotomy, you only re remove coronal pulp. Pulpectomy, you take all the pulp out. You remove both the coronal and the radicular part of the pulp tissue. So this is no longer vital pulp therapy because, well, we're remo removing all the pulp and there's nothing left. So the pulpal diagnosis back in our uh, second video of the series, this would become a you know, previously treated pulp. It wouldn't be vital. It wouldn't be necrotic. It just wouldn't have a pulp anymore because we treated it. And again, this is, uh, well, it can be often used as temporary pain relief on teeth with irreversible pulpitis until a full root canal uh, can be done. But again, it's really reserved for uh, primary teeth and it would be for a non-vital and restorable primary tooth with a pulp exposure. And for those primary teeth, it's just, just best that they're asymptomatic to have the best chance of success. Um, so really pulpectomy, you're either, you have a patient who comes in for urgent care, is in a lot of pain, you just do this as a temporary measure until you can do the full root canal treatment with the gutta percha, or you have a pediatric patient with a non-vital and restorable primary tooth with an asymptomatic pulp exposure. So those are your two kind of uh, certain, two different scenarios where you'd be doing a pulpectomy procedure. And again, it's similar to the pulpotomy. You'd have uh, zinc oxide eugenol in the crown, but you'd be using calcium hydroxide in the root this time. So no need for formal cresol because we're not leaving any pulp. Uh, no need for no need for any of this like fixation zone or coagulation necrosis because again we're removing the entire pulp with a pulpectomy and we're using this calcium hydroxide because well we're going to take advantage of the fact that it's resorbable because if we're using this in a primary tooth we want the underlying permanent tooth to be able to erupt normally and for that calcium hydroxide to be resorbed so it's a great material to be used in that scenario All right, and then we have the, the classic extraction. And so this would be another option, removal of a tooth with a dead or dying pulp. And for primary uh, teeth, this would be really for something that's non-restorable. So we can't put a crown on it, it's just not savable, then we really have no other option than to extract it and try to maintain that space uh, with some other measure. We also would opt to do an extraction over a pulpectomy for a primary first molar. And this is kind of a generalization, but certainly can be tested on the board exam because primary first molars have lots of accessory canals and they're very challenging to perform a successful pulpectomy on. So in those scenarios where the pulp anatomy is just very complex, not likely, again, the risk of having failure outweighs the potential benefit of doing it, so it's just best to sometimes extract those primary first molars, not try to save them. Also, if the tooth is exhibiting some root resorption, it's symptomatic, the patient's being bothered by it, a pulpectomy may not fix the problem. So really, we should opt to extract that tooth. So these things are really, really important when considering treatment options for a primary tooth if you're gonna go the pulpectomy or the pulpotomy route versus extracting that tooth. So I'd definitely be familiar with these uh, facts, why you would do an extraction in this case. All right, and then we have the classic root canal treatment. Again, the pulp can be diseased or dead when you're opting to do this procedure. And again, maybe a little overgeneralization, but it's basically a pulpectomy where we remove all the pulp from both the coronal and radicular segments, and you clean it, you shape the canals, and then you fill it with that gutta percha or other obtur obturation material. And so I've talked about this a lot in my third video of this series, so if you haven't watched that one, definitely go check that out. All right, and now we have um, two things, uh, two treatments that I listed in our comprehensive list of endodontic therapies that
are a little bit confusing. And so I definitely want to focus in on these next two. And I hopefully will be able to clarify any confusion um, for these two procedures. So apexogenesis literally means formation of, you could say the apex, or we could say the root. So root formation, let's say. That's what apexogenesis is trying to do. And so apexogenesis is maintaining pulp vitality in order to stimulate root development and allow the body to make a stronger root. So this is a vital pulp therapy. We have a pulp that is vital. It's healthy or diseased, but it is vital. And we're going to try to maintain that vitality in order for the root to finish developing. So we're going to use something like calcium hydroxide or MTA, one of those two materials we talked about at the start of the video. And here's the thing that really, really helped me figure this out. Apexogenesis technically includes any indirect pulp cap, direct pulp cap, spec pulpotomy, or full pulpotomy performed in an immature permanent tooth. Basically, all of the vital pulp therapies we've talked about thus far, when they are performed on an immature permanent tooth where the root is still developing, this is when we can technically refer to it as apexogenesis because the whole point of it is seeking to si stimulate continued root development for a nice, strong, sturdy root. So we have a tooth like this where the root has not completed development, the apex is wide open, we have some kind of pulp exposure, and then depending on all those factors we talked about, we can decide which one of the four of these we want to do. Once we, now this next picture doesn't show the restoration, but say this was restored somehow, and we want to get this result where the root can still finish developing and we get a nice, strong, sturdy root, and that's a great, great result. So say for this one, we had a pulp exposure less than 24 hours ago, we wanna do direct pulp cap, and that would be direct pulp cap plus ap apexogenesis, because that is our goal here. We want to make sure the root can finish developing. And this is contraindicated in avulsed, non-restorable, severe horizontal root fracture, and necrotic teeth. So that's apexogenesis. And the other one is apexification. And this one is not a vital pulp therapy because the tooth is not alive. The, the tooth does not have a vital pulp. And so this one is not about allowing the root to finish developing, but rather some way to close off that root, to attain root end closure. And so apexification would be disinfection of the root canal followed by induction of an acceptable apical barrier in order to block off that end of the root that just not has not finished developing yet. And so again, we would opt to use either of those two materials, calcium hydroxide or MTA, placed at the base of the canal after the dead or dying pulp is entirely removed. And so like we had our, um, in red font here, our uh, parallel between vital pulp therapies performed on an immature permanent tooth, apexification is a pulpectomy performed in an immature permanent tooth. So again, these two apex treatments Think about an immature permanent tooth where the root has not finished developing yet, and the pulpectomy is performed in this scenario in order not to allow the, uh, the root to finish formation because that is unfortunately out of the window, but we can at least form an apical barrier to prevent uh, retrograde infection, to prevent uh, the spread of disease by sealing off the apex. So those two things, hopefully that really clarifies things for you, that apexogenesis and apexification are referring exclusively to immature permanent teeth and doing either vital or non-vital pulp therapy to try to um, heal, heal up or seal off the apex.
All right, and that about covers it for this series. Um, note that I would also group internal bleaching, which is placing bleaching agent within the pulp space of an endodontically treated tooth, into this category of adjunctive endodontic therapies. But I don't believe I had any questions asked on internal bleaching, so I didn't include it in the video. But I will put a link in the description to a video that I did on internal bleaching if you want to check that out. I think it's a really super interesting topic on its own. So uh, definitely check that out if you want to learn more about internal bleaching. But yeah, that's it for this video series. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I really appreciate all the support. I will be putting together a bonus video because that was very popular with the oral pathology series, and I will model those questions after actual board exam questions so you get a feel of the kind of things that I've been stressing as very high-yield topics in endodontics, and so hopefully you can apply the things you learned and check those questions out. So thank you so much for watching, everyone, and we will see you in the next video.